Well, I'm thankful to Pope Francis, to Cardinal Muller, to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith for convening this important colloquium and for the opportunity to address you today. Poet Wendell Berry observed several years ago in reacting to the technological utopianism of naturalistic scientism that the key question of the modern era is whether or not we will think of persons as machines or as creatures. I believe that this question frames the entire discussion that we have today. If we are creatures, then we have meaning and purpose and dignity, but with that, we have limits. If we see ourselves as machines, then we will believe that the Faustian myth of our own limitless power and the ability to reshape even what it means to be human. And this is, it seems to me, the question at the heart of the controversies that we face around marriage and sexuality. Are we created, as both the Hebrew scriptures and Jesus of Nazareth put it, male and female from the beginning? Or are these categories arbitrary or self-willed? Do our bodies and our sexes and our generational connectedness, do they represent something of who we were designed to be and thus place both limits on our ability to recreate ourselves and responsibilities for those who will come after us? Those of us at this gathering have many differences. We come from different countries, sometimes with tensions between those countries. We hold to different religions, sometimes with great divergences there on what we believe about God and life and the meaning of life. But all of us in this room share at least one thing in common. We did not spring into existence out of nothing, but each one of us can trace his or her origins back to a man and a woman, a mother and a father. We recognize that marriage and family, these are matters of public importance, not just of our various theological and ecclesial distinctive communities, but since marriage is embedded in the creation order and is the means of human flourishing, not simply the arena of individual human desires and appetites. We recognize that marriage and the sexual difference on which it is built is grounded in a natural order bearing rights and responsibilities. We recognize that marriage and family were not created or crafted by any human state and thus cannot be redefined by any human state. It is no accident then that questions of marriage and family bring such heated debate since our consciences and our very being testify that these matters are of critical importance as to how we shall live. As an evangelical Christian, I come to this discussion with motivations about the common good and human flourishing, but beyond these natural goods to an even deeper concern for what I believe to be the purpose of the entire cosmos, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of us must stand together, whatever our views, on conserving the truth of marriage as a complementary union of a man and a woman, but I would add that there is a distinctive Christian urgency to why Christian churches must bear witness to these things. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus that the alpha and omega of the universe, the goal of the cosmos, is summed up in what he called the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 1.10. One key aspect of this unveiled mystery is that of the family structure. It's not an arbitrary expression of nature, but instead marriage and family are archetypes, icons of God's purpose for the universe. When the apostle appealed to the Genesis 2 account that the creation order explains why a man must leave father and mother to cleave to his wife, that they become one flesh, he wrote of something that every human being can see and recognize, even without divine revelation. After all, human cultures have died out for a variety of reasons, but no human culture has ever died out because the people therein forgot to have sexual intercourse. <laughs> the drive toward marital unity is powerful, so powerful that it can feel as wild as fire. In Paul's Christian theology, this universal truth is because the one flesh union points beyond itself to the meaning of the universe, to the union of Christ 
and his church, which is why, as a Christian, I believe this explains why it is not good for the man to be alone, why the man needed someone similar to him and yet different from him, and fitted together, they form an organic union as a head with a body. Humanity then, in the image of God, created male and female with male and female identities that correspond to one another and fulfill one another. We are not created as spouse A and spouse B, but as man and as woman, and in marriage as husband and wife, in parenting as mother and as father. Masculinity and femininity are not aspects of the fallen order to be overcome, but they are instead part of what God declared from the very beginning to be very good. A man is created then to be other-directed, to pour himself into his family. Headship, in God's design, is not Pharaoh-like tyranny, but Christ-like sacrifice. Jesus said of his church in its original 12 foundation stones that he did not call them servants, but friends. And the relationship between a husband and a wife is not that of a business model or a corporate organizational chart, but of an organic unity. The more a husband and a wife are sanctified together, the more they, like a nervous system and a body, move and operate together smoothly, effortlessly, holistically. They are one flesh. This is cooperation through complementarity. And in their lives together, as in the life of Christ and his church, this love is life-giving, including when God wills issuing in the new generation. The current debates over whether marriage itself is good, over whether children need mothers and fathers, over whether sexual expression should be bound by the covenantal reality of the male-female male one-flesh union, they assume a very different reading of humanity, one that assumes an entirely different understanding of what it means to be a person. Western culture now celebrates casual sexuality, cohabitation, no-fault divorce, marriage redefinition, and abortion rights as parts of a sexual revolution that they say can tear down old patriarchal systems. But this is not the case. The sexual revolution is not liberation at all. The sexual revolution is merely the imposition of a different sort of patriarchy. The sexual revolution empowers men to pursue a Darwinian fantasy of the predatory alpha male rooted in the values of power, prestige, and personal pleasure. Amen. Does anyone really believe that these things will empower women and children when we see the wreckage of sexuality as self-expression all around us, and we will see more yet? And the stakes are not merely social or cultural or political, but profoundly spiritual. Every culture has recognized that there is something about sexuality that is more than merely the firing of nerve endings. There's something mysterious here, the joining of selves. And in an evangelical Christian perspective, that's because there is no such thing as a casual sexual encounter at all when we're speaking in spiritual terms. The Apostle Paul warned that the sexually immoral person, as he puts it, sins not just against another, but against his own body. He compared the spiritual union formed between Christ and the believer with the union brought about in the sexual act. Even one, Paul says, who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her. Immorality, then, is not merely naughtiness. It is a, a sermon and a sermon that is preaching something very different from the sermon that God has given us to preach. That's why attempts to free sexuality from marriage as the union of a man and a woman, they do not lead ultimately to the sort of liberation they promise. And therein is our challenge and our opportunity for the future. 
In the Gospel of John, Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman by Jacob's well. The account immediately follows his, his conversation with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And the contrast could not be more striking. Nicodemus was a son of Israel, a teacher, while the woman was of despised Samaria. Nicodemus was a moral exemplar, while the woman was a moral wreck of indiscretions. Nicodemus came at night. She came at noonday. Jesus encountered both with a message that John tells us was filled with truth and grace. Woman wanted to speak of many issues, many arguments. But Jesus said to her, remarkably, go get your husband and come here. Both parts of that sentence are necessary. Some would suggest that Jesus should not address the question of her marital status, of her sexual immorality. He should, they would say, simply reach her where she is. But Jesus recognized that this indeed is where she was. Without addressing the issue of sin, he could not address the invitation to mercy. Because the gospel, as he tells us, comes not to the righteous, but to sinners. Many would tell us that contemporary people will not hear us if we contradict the assumptions of the sexual revolution. We ought to conceal or at least avoid the conversation of what we believe about the definition of marriage, about the limits of human sexuality, about the created and good nature of gender, and speak instead in more generic spiritual terms. We have heard this before. Indeed, we hear it in every generation. A previous generation was told that modern people could not accept the miraculous claims of the ancient church creeds, and that if we were to reach people where they are, we should emphasize instead merely the ethical content of Christianity, the golden rule, and de-emphasize the scandal of such things as virgin births and empty tombs and second comings. The churches that followed this path are now deader than Henry VIII. <laughs> because it, it turns out that people who don't want Christianity also don't want almost Christianity. And more importantly, those churches that altered their message adopted what Presbyterian theologian J. Gresham Machen rightly identified as an entirely different religion. The stakes are just as high now. To jettison or to minimize a Christian sexual ethic is to abandon the message Jesus handed to us, and we have no authority to do that. Moreover, to do so would be to abandon our love for our neighbors. We cannot offer the world the half gospel of a surgical strike targeted universalism which exempts from God's judgment those sins we fear are too fashionable to address. <laughs> the union of truth and grace is necessary because the gospel tells us that God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And the gospel tells us that left to ourselves, all of us, all of us are cut off from the life of God, that we fall short of the glory of God, and that our only hope is to be joined to another, to be hidden in the life and righteousness of Jesus Christ, crucified for sinners and raised by the power of God, received through faith. There are always, and there will always be, almost gospels that seek to circumvent either God's justice or God's mercy. On the one side, there's the airy antinomianism of those who would seek good news apart from the righteousness of God. But such a gospel, severed from the justice of God, is not good news at all. It suggests that somehow we can approach God without repentance, that we can come to Jesus as Savior but not as Lord, that we can continue in sin that grace may abound. And the apostolic response to that is quite clear and indeed could not be stronger, God forbid. On the other side, there's the equally perilous temptation to emphasize the righteousness of God without the invitation to mercy. 
Christian gospel tells us that there is life offered to any repentant sinner and that with that life there is a household of belonging with brothers and sisters and a place at the table of a joyous wedding feast. That's why Jesus said to the woman, both go get your husband and come here. So must we. Jesus intentionally went to Samaria. His disciples, James and John, wanted elsewhere in the gospel to vaporize the villages there with fire from heaven. <laughs> but Jesus spoke of water, of living water that could quench thirst forever, using language that is present in the Hebrew scriptures for longing for God of water in a desert land. We live in a culture that is obsessed with sex. Sex abstracted from covenant, from fidelity, from transcendent moral norms. But beyond this obsession, there is a cry for something more. In the search for sexual excitement, men and women are not really looking for biochemical sensations. They are searching desperately not merely for sex. They are searching for that to which sex points something they know exists, but they cannot identify. They are thirsting. As novelist Frederick Buechner put it, lust is the craving for salt for someone who is dying of thirst. The sexual revolution cannot keep its promises. People are looking for a cosmic mystery, for a love that is stronger than death. They cannot articulate it, and perhaps they would be horrified to know it, but they are looking for God. Amen. The sexual revolution leads to the burned over boredom of sex shorn of mystery, shorn of covenant. But the question for us as we pass through the Samaria of the sexual revolution is whether we will have water for Samaria or if we will only have fire. In the wake of the disappointment that sexual libertarianism brings, there must be a new word about more permanent things, such as the joy of marriage as permanent, conjugal, one flesh reality between a man and a woman. We must keep lit the way to the old paths. This means that we must both articulate and embody a vision for marriage. We will not capitulate on these issues because we cannot. We must create cultures where men are taught to live in other-directed, self-sacrificial leadership on behalf of one's family, one's community. We must create cultures where women are valued not for their sexual availability and attractiveness to men, but for the sort of fidelity and courage that the Apostle Peter wrote of as that of a daughter of Sarah. We must work for the common good, in contrast with the sexually libertarian carnivals around us, to speak of the meaning of men and women, of mothers and fathers, of sex and of life, and we must stand against the will to power that reduces children to commodities to be manufactured and nuisances to be destroyed. Our neighbors of no religion and of different religions may not recognize a call to gospel ministry, to gospel mystery, but marriage is a common grace, and we should speak on their own terms of why jettisoning normative marriage and family is harmful. But as a Christian, I'm also compelled to speak of the conviction of the church that what is disrupted when we move beyond the creation design of marriage and family is not only human flourishing, although it is that, but also the picture of the very mystery that defines the existence of the universe itself, the gospel of Jesus Christ. With this conviction, we must stand and speak, not with clenched fists or with wringing hands, but with the open hearts of those who have a message and a mission. And we will do so, reminding the world that we are not mere machines of flesh, but rather we are creatures accountable to nature and to nature's God. And we do so with the confidence of those who know that on the other side of our culture wars, there's a sexual counter-revolution waiting to be born again. Thank you. <laughs>